All right, next week I will preach a message on the resurrection. We will gather for Easter Sunday morning. We will have sunrise service in the parking lot around 645, and we'll have our morning worship service at 1045. This morning, uh, a word for all of us. I pray you'll receive it, and it will be helpful to you. It is Ecclesiastes, crook in the lot. Uh, represents your life is something that is bent. When God bends something in your life, who can... We currently live in a weird religious age where the desire for everything to end with this quote, they lived happily ever after. That's what America wants. That's what general public wants these days is for everything to work out for everything to end with a happy ending everybody wants every all oh, because so oh, great surely we can overcome this soon well what do you do if we live in a world filled with affliction and we read the bible through optimism we, we, we read the Bible and think that everything ends with a hallmark ending. We read the Bible thinking everything's going to get better. Everybody's going to get well. The hospitals are going to empty out. People are going to have their money come in. and Everything's going to get better. But yet when we read the Bible, we find that not all stories work out that way. Stephen was a man of God, was he not? Stephen preached the Word of God. He stood boldly for the Word of God, and they stoned him to death. Not everything works out with a happy ending. In our country, we have a very low view of affliction. We have a very low view of affliction. We have a low view of suffering. And we have a low view of loss. Any of those categories we think are all negative. If there's any affliction, it's bad. If there's any suffering, it's bad. If there's any loss, it's bad. But yet I would say to you from the Word of God that suffering could be the greatest thing that could happen in your life. Suffering could be the greatest thing that could happen in the country of America or even in this world. That God would so shake us and stop us from all of our busyness, all our carnality, and all our worldliness, that would be for our greatest good. The very purposes of God are lost upon us because we have constructed a God who looks more like some hallmark ending than the God of Scripture. The God that American religion has created cannot seem to do anything in the world that is conceived of as negative. If anything negative happens today, you can listen to Christian radio. If you listen to the Christian radio station, COVID-19 came from the world and God's greater than the world. Or they'll say, well, we know God didn't send this. We know God had nothing to do with this. If God is not in charge of COVID-19, pray tell me who is. And you read the Bible and you find out, who, who do you think sent the plagues in Egypt? Uh, who sent the frogs? Who sent the flies? Who sent the locusts? Who sent the drought? Who turned the water into blood? If God's not in the one in charge of sending the plagues, then who's in charge? But you see, God is in the heavens doing as He pleases, and He would send a virus in order to shut down a world, in order that people would gather in a parking lot and say, you know what, maybe we ought to get right with God because our lives are important that we be right with Him. My text again says, consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? Here's the bottom line of my sermon or the overriding thought is this. God puts crooks in our lot for his own divine purpose. And our responses to these crooks reveal the reality of our relationship to him. Crook in your lot. The word crook means to distort something, to deform something. It, it's like a, in regards to a potter who takes the clay and bends it in a goofy or in a, in a, in a distorted type way, he bends the clay. This, this is the word here, to bend something out of the norm. 
or to make crooked, to distort something. But notice this, God bends or God crooks or God distorts something in our life, but He doesn't bend us. He bends the situation, and then we have to respond to the situation that He has bent. Let me give you an example. You all, at least the church knows this example. But let's say you've got a young family, and you're young, you're married, you've got a couple of kids, you've got your life planned out, you've got direction, and you, you've got all these things you've got worked out, and then all of a sudden your wife gets pregnant. Again, for the third time, she's pregnant. And you get all excited, and you get all these plans, you get all the room together, you get all the baby clothes together, and everything's going good. And then all of a sudden, things go drastically wrong, and you end up in a hot Your baby's born, and it's no then. This is a crook in your lot. And it's so, such a bend that it changes everything. And all of life, as you had it planned out, now is shut down and everything changes because now you have a situation that you can't make straight. There's a family sitting right over here. What do you do when your child's brain won't fit in his head and they have to go in and cut his head open expand his cranium in order to give room to his brain. That's a pretty big crook in their lot. Their whole world shuts down and everything is turned because now their life has been bent. What do you do when God is a crook your lot, when he bends your life? Well, my text tells us this morning, number one, this is how you are to respond, church. This is how you are to respond, world. Number one, consider. Consider. Meditate. Think. Look, all I can do is give you the information from the Word of God. I challenge you. Consider how God works. Meditate upon the ways of God. Read your Bible. Read the whole thing from beginning to end. How does God work in history? What does He do? Meditate upon those things. Think deeply upon those things. Look, you watch the news. You sit there. You drink your coffee. You drink your beer. You watch the news. You take in all the information. You scan your computer. You look at Facebook. You look at all the social media posts. You go through all the information. And you get through with it all. You have fear well up in your heart. I'm telling you this morning, turn it off and consider the work of God. Think about how God works. Think about what God does. Is there any examples in Scripture to deal with a plague? Is there any examples in Scripture where God worked and radically impacted the world and shook everybody up and to the degree that they repented and asked for mercy? Do we have any examples in God's Word? Consider God, consider His work. How has He worked? How does He work? How will He work? To meditate upon the things of God is very, very biblical. Let me give you a spattering of Scripture, if you will, on the word meditation or the word meditate. Let the words of my mouth, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. My mouth will speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart will be understanding. My meditation will be pleasing to Him, for I rejoice in the Lord. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. The psalmist understood this. Meditating upon the things of God or the thing is, is exactly what brought consolation or comfort to his heart. To think upon God brought him strength, brought him faith, brought him favor, brought him grace, and he wanted his meditation to be pleasing unto God. And continuing on with meditate, he says, In the watches of the night, I meditate upon you. I remember you and I meditate, and when I do, my spirit faints. In my heart, I will ponder your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. I will ponder your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Wouldn't it be a bit encouraging? 
for you to know that God can part the Red Sea, that people can walk on dry ground? Wouldn't it be important for you to know that God can give blind men sight? Wouldn't it be important for you to know that God can make dead men live? That if we had meditated upon things like that, that we might be a bit encouraged to see God's work in history? Would it someone encourage you to know that God's Word never fails, but it always accomplishes what it's sent forth to do? And that if we would meditate on things like that, that we would understand that the Word of God trumps it trumps the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the mayor, the governor, and all the people in the whole world that God's word is supreme over all the powers that be and they couldn't even have any power unless God put them in the place that they're in and that God has set them there for our good but they are subservient to the king of heaven we can meditate and find that from the word of God and we can say you know what let God be true and every man a liar well meditate upon his works Meditate on your statutes. I will meditate on your wondrous works. I will meditate on your statutes. I will meditate on your precepts. I will meditate on your promises. I will under the work of your hands. The psalmist understood this. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. Ask everybody here within the sound of my voice today, would you receive counsel from the Word of God? Let this sink into your heart, and you would say, today I am making this my choice in life. I am going to meditate on the things of God, the person of God, all the voices in the world, because my God is true, and He's faithful, and He's promises and I know that he can be trusted so I will resolve to meditate upon him you know why because when you meditate on the work of God you'll find some things that happen and so let me be the killer of the Hallmark movie this morning if you will God God's work is different than the comprehension of human philosophies let me just give you a spattering of thoughts. I just want you to know people get sick. People do get sick. Anyway, this is not some kind of religion that somehow you go to church and everybody's healthy, wealthy, and wise. It's not some kind of church here where you preach the Word of God and we all live forever. We know better. People get sick. People die of cancer every day. A lot more people die from cancer than they do COVID-19. A lot more people die from the flu than they do COVID-19. But we need to grapple church this morning with this reality. People die. They get sick. They go to the hospital. They die. And then we preach a funeral. And we bury them in the ground. Why? Because life does not last forever. Think about it. There's people in these nice houses back here. There's people in these trailer houses over here. There's people in an RV park over there. And some of them will get sick. And they'll get bad sick. And some of them will die from their sickness. We live in a world where people get sick. People die. People lose their jobs. There's people in this parking lot that can't work. And they're not making an income right now because of COVID-19. People get fired. People get laid off. Companies shut down. These things happen in life. The church doesn't have to put her head in the dirt and act like it doesn't go on. It goes on all over the place. People struggle when they don't have an income, when they don't receive money to buy groceries. Things get difficult, but that's the world in which we live. That is the effects of sin. And by the way, people get old. People get to their 80s and their 90s and they get dementia and they get Alzheimer's and they go in nursing homes and sometimes you go to visit them and they don't even know who you are and your heart breaks because they don't even recognize you, especially if it's your beloved wife or your beloved husband and they don't even know who you are anymore. Those kind of things hurt and they break your heart, but it's what happens when people get older and we have to wrestle with that. It's a crook in our lot that we have to deal with and we can't escape it it's the reality of this fallen world that we exist in and i'll tell you on top of all of that people sin and they transgress the law of god and they break god's law and they do unholy things and they do immoral things and people in this parking lot have sinned this week we sin and we mess up because we're a fallen creation 
It's, it's just the life we live. We're in this together. And I also say this to you. God works in his church in, in a different way than the church growth gurus would say to you. Those of you that got a church background, I can tell you right now, all those books they wrote on church growth, right now you can throw them in the trash because they're not working. They're not working. And they say, well, well, you know, all these churches are trying to do church growth. Now they can't even meet. Now how are you going to build your mega church? He said, none of that stuff works anymore. I just want to remind you, churches sometimes shrink. Not every church grows. Uh, my good friend, Pastor Brett, he goes up to West Frankfurt to pastor his church. Nice church. Everything's going good. All these people, he's all excited. He's not there hardly any time. You know what happens? The church burned down. Churches burn down. Churches shrink. Churches go bankrupt and close the doors. Churches die. Churches have adversities. Churches burn. Tornadoes come. Hurricanes come. Floods come. I'm just telling you, all of these types of things happen. Churches get old. Churches move. Churches sell. Churches commit sin. We do not live in a perfect world. The God of heaven brings things into our midst that bend our life. They're crook in our lot. And so we have plans and directions, churches, individuals, families, and we've got all this planned out, and then God bends it. He bends it. And you got, well, when he bends it, what do you do? How do you make it straight? How do you make, make the newborn baby straight? How do you straighten out a kid that's got to have his skull fractured in order for it to be expanded? How do you deal with these things? How do you make them straight? God would bring them. That the God of heaven would bring COVID-19 on the world. How are you going to make that straight? You think about it. How are you going to open the restaurant today? How are you going to open the department store today? How are you going to open the mall today? How are you going to open the park today? How can you straighten this thing out? How can you make your job go back to being what you thought was normal? How can you make your family go back to what you consider a normalcy? You know, where you run all over and do all the little things we do. How can you get back to normal when God says, I'm not going to allow it? God puts a crook in your life and alters everything and God forces you to deal with the situation. You hear? This is what happened. God has forced us to deal with the situation we have before us. He has grasped our attention. He has shut us down. He has stopped our normal activity that perhaps we would finally stop and consider... The work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? By the way, when it comes to church stories and the Bible, you know, Jonah doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you understand that God put a crook in Jonah's life. You, you know Jonah, right? What happens with Jonah? Jonah has a plan. I'm going to go down here. I'm going to pay a fare for a boat, and I'm going to go to Tarshish. I'll pay my own fare, I'll make my own way, and I'll do things the way that I want to do them. And that's what Jonah sets out to do. But God put a crook in his lot. God bent his life, and he sends a storm, and he shakes his life to the degree that the pagans throw him overboard. Why? Because the crook in Jonah's life was in order that the gospel would be preached in Nineveh, in order that from the king all the way down, they would repent and dust and sackcloth and ashes and plead for the mercy of God not to destroy them. And when you understand that God would put the crook, then the book of Jonah makes perfectly good sense. What about John the Baptist? What about the crook in John the Baptist's life? John the Baptist, his life makes no sense unless you understand this. John the Baptist was a righteous man. He was a holy man. He was a godly man. He was a faithful preacher. And so what's the crook in his lot? He has to wear rough clothing. He has a weird diet. He has isolation. He has imprisonment. And you know what it leads to? They take and cut his head off and serve it on a platter. 
That's a pretty tough crook. But if you understand that God would bring a crook like that in order to magnify the gospel and build the church and send a message out to the whole world, you say, oh, God had a bigger purpose here than what we first imagined. God brought this about in order that the gospel would flourish to the ends of the world. I'll give you a bigger crook than that. The life of Jesus makes no sense unless you understand the crook in Jesus' life. (laughs) Jesus was in isolation. He was hated. He was slandered. He suffered physically. And ultimately, he was nailed to a tree, naked before the world, pouring out all of his blood upon the ground, under the wrath of Almighty God. That's a pretty big crook in someone's life. Think about it. Jesus knew from the beginning. He's going to live a perfect life. He's not going to sin in word, in thought, or in deed. What's the crook in his lot? The cross. He knows that's where he's going is to the cross. But even though this direction seems bent to I mean, who designs for a perfect man to be crucified on a tree? It seems bent. But you don't see Jesus fighting against the crook in his lot. You see him in humility walking faith to Calvary to substitute for sinners. And in doing so, that all who would repent and believe could have everlasting life. I'm so thankful my Savior didn't rebel to the crook in his lot, but he submitted. And we are to learn from our Savior. He's COVID-19, or you have some other crook in your lot. God puts a crook in your lot. Then humble yourself and respond in a way in which would bring glory to God. Now back to my text, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 13. The subject of my text is you. The first word in the text is consider. The subject is you. The verb is to consider or to meditate. The direct object is work. The God where everything works out in a way that makes your flesh feel good. Because he's not in the Bible. The God of heaven bends things on purpose to get attention. Questions about the crook in the lot. And ask questions biblically speaking, in order for us to grasp this and understand that God's the one who bends things. And these are easy Sunday school questions, but I think we've overlooked the realities of them. I ask you this question. Who do you think brought the rain during Noah's day? You, you see on the news today, if there's a flood in a province, a county, or an area, and there's this big flood and all these homes are lost, people are, I mean, it's devastating, and you watch who gets blamed. Oh, the devil did it. Oh, Mother Nature did it. Oh, this did it. Oh, the seasons. Oh, it was global warming, or global cooling, or global, just make up a word and use it. But when you come to the Bible... And you see that the whole world was flooded. And you see that men, women, boys, and girls drowned in a global flood. Nobody will deny the reality that in the Bible it was God who made it rain. God who shut the door. God brought the flood. And if those people of Noah and his family would not have gathered, they would have drowned that day as well. As a side note... In days like this, that's why we need to gather. We need to gather where we can hear from God. But I ask you the opposite question. Who withheld the rain in the days of Elijah and the droughts in the land? He said, there's a drought, there's no rain, what do you do? He tells the young man, go up there and pray. He said, go up there and see if there's a cloud. See if there's rain coming. And he does this seven times until God sends this cloud and it develops into rain. God sends the rain. God withholds the rain, God floods, God brings drought. God puts the crook in our lot. Let me ask you this. We've already said it, so I won't stay here long, but who sent the plagues upon Pharaoh and all of Egypt? And do you remember as those plagues progressed and they got a little bit more severe? Here's a good one. Do you remember when they changed and the plagues only affected Egypt, but the people of God were spared? Who is it that can plague one location and only have certain people affected by it? 
It is God who brought these plagues. You know right now in this world that God could bring COVID-19 and have this effect on this person and no effect on that person. He can use it for judgment upon this person and discipline upon this person. And God can do whatever He jolly well pleases with COVID-19. Church, do you believe and understand that God's in control of these things? Let me ask you this, in that godless society of homosexuality and sodomy, in a place called Sodom and Gomorrah, who rained down fire and sulfur on that place? Who brought the judgment? Who brought that all down upon them and destroyed that wicked city? Was it not God who bent that city to His will and saved righteous Lot out of it? We need to have a biblical, robust understanding that God does these things in this world in which we live. And He's presently doing things like this in order that you and me, that He would get our attention, that we would turn to look to Him as the priority of who we worship. You remember a guy in the New Testament, a guy by the name of Zechariah? You remember that he was mute And could not speak. Remember when his wife was pregnant and he couldn't speak? My question is, who made him mute? He said, what would happen today if right now I lose my voice and I'm mute? You say, well, who made him mute? I would wonder at the theories of our world and what they would come up with as to why I had become mute. Well, who made Zachariah mute? I can tell you what Moses said in in the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute? Who makes him deaf? Who makes him seeing? Who makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Church, did you hear? God says He makes mute. He makes deaf. He makes blind. He makes those who can see or not see. And he says, it is I, the Lord, who would do this. You say, preacher, you're telling me that God would make someone mute? Yes, because that's what the Word of God says. You're saying that God would make someone blind? Yes, because that's what the Word of God says. You say, well, that's a pretty big crook in someone's lot. It's a big crook in someone's lot, but it can be used in a way that would bring glory to Him and be for their good. I ask you this, what about the guy in John chapter 9 who was born blind? It wasn't because of the sin of his parents. It wasn't because of his own sin. He was made blind for the glory of God. There were other children born that weren't blind. Why is he born blind? Because God determined for him to be blind. But the issue was used for the great glory of God. So the implication of my question would be this. Who can make it straight? Who who can make it straight? If the man's born blind, who can straighten it out? If the man's born lame, who can make him walk? If the man's born deaf, who can make him hear? If God sends a flood, who can stop it? If God dries up the heavens and the ground turns as hard as concrete, who can make it wet? If your grandson's born the size of your hand, how can you make him the size of normalcy? How can you fix these crooks if a COVID-19 shakes the world? How can you stop it? How can you straighten it out? You can print two more trillion dollars, but you can't stop COVID-19. You can't make it straight. That's what my text says. Who can make straight what God has made crooked? Hey, this church sign up here. There's people around town. We're praying for this to end quickly. I'm not. We want this over fast. I don't. You say, What's wrong with you? I want God to have a full dose of patience that He would make us be shook for a long time until people actually got real with God and they started repenting of sin, started worshiping King Jesus, and that He would be the priority of their life. If that takes to 2025, then shut down all sporting events and all schools to 2025 until finally a America comes to repentance and asks for the mercy of God upon their life. 
That's what we need. Because if we're not right with God, we're not right. And I'll tell you, you can mark it down, you can quote it. If things turn around and tomorrow everything goes back to normal, I'll tell you what will happen in Azel. Everybody will go back to doing exactly what they were doing before, and they'll be busy like they was before. They'll go to dance, they'll toot their horns, and they'll chase their football, and they'll throw their ball through the hoop, and they'll go run around the park, and they'll go to their bass boat, they'll go to their hunting blood, and they'll do all the stuff that they want to do, and they'll say, if I get a break, I might go by and see God. That's what will happen if God lets up right now. So that he would keep a sense of, of a pressure upon us, a crook in our lot, until finally our hearts are broken enough that we would become serious with Him. Who can make straight what He has made crooked? You remember the Apostle Paul, do you not? Put a thorn in his flesh. Three times I entreated of the Lord to have it removed. He said, I'm not removing it. You have to deal with it. You have to humble yourself and become teachable. Think about some other crooks that God put in the lot of people. You remember Moses delivered the people out of Egypt? It's a great story, right? You get all you have to go around for 40 years in the wilderness. You can see the promised land. Can I enter it? No. You can't go in. And he didn't get to enter. What a crook in the lot. You remember Abraham? He prays, Can Ishmael, my son, dwell in your presence? No. You remember King David, a man after God's own heart? Oh God, I'm going to fast and pray. Would you heal my son? Your child's going to die. Your child's going to die and he died. Seventy years of captivity in Babylon. Do you understand in 70 years that numerous hundreds of children were born into captivity and in captivity they didn't even sin. They weren't even alive in all the rebellion. They were born into captivity, raised in captivity, and having to do life in captivity because God had put a crook in the lot of Israel. The disciples... Peter, James, John, and all the rest faithfully followed the Lord. They obeyed God. And you know what? There's a crook in their lot. What was the crook? It was called martyrdom. Exiled on the Isle of Patmos. Crucified upside down. Burned to the stake. Stoned to death. What a crook was put in their lot. You remember oh, Ezekiel the prophet? Bold and faithful, godly man, faithful and true, preaching the word of God. You go through the book of Ezekiel and you get to about chapter 24. And you know what happens? His wife dies. His wife dies. You say, well, how, how can it work out that way? Sometimes God puts a crook in the lot and preachers lose their wives and they die. Because that's the world in which we live and God brings that upon us. You think about the apostle Paul. Labor. Prison, beatings, lashes, beatings with a rod, stoning, shipwreck, drifting helplessly at sea, hard journeys, snake bites, dangers, toil, hardship, sleeplessness, sleeplessness, hunger, thirst, cold, and exposure. And then on top of all of that was the daily anxiety of the churches that weighed upon him, that he wanted them to be right with God. And then we've mentioned, but we mention again, Jesus' crook involved what? Being deserted by his closest friends, being beaten, being spit upon, being whipped, maligned, speared, pierced, stripped, and absorbing the wrath of his Father in the midst of the crucifixion as a substitute for sinners. You say, it's a, a lot of this doesn't sound like good news to me. A lot of this sounds a little bit difficult. None of this stuff is new. This is all biblical stories I'm bringing to you. I'm telling you from the Word of God that we need to consider how God works. He does these types of things in our life. 
People get sick. People die. Viruses break out. Stock markets crash. Depressions come. Fires burn. Hurricanes destroy. Tornadoes tear up whole towns. Babies are born uh, that are not formed correctly. They're pre-born. Those types of things happen in our life. We do not live in heaven. Do you hear me? We don't live those things you're wanting to be perfect. They will be in glory, but we're not there. We're in America, a sin-filled, immoral, selfish, materialistic society that lives for a numero uno, thinking the world revolves around them, but it's not going to be that way in heaven. And every time God brings a crook in your lot, He is trying to wake you up to the reality that He is to be the priority of your life. He's saying, I created you to worship me. What are you doing? He's saying, when there's a virus, then worship God. Pray, repent, read your Bible, seek Him early and often, and worship Him because He's been gracious and good to you. If the preacher Solomon has taught me anything, It's that satisfaction with God trumps all lesser pleasures. There's you a good thought to chew on for a bit. Those things that a month ago you thought you had to have, how important are they now? Two months ago at Christmas time when you were at Black Friday and all that stuff, spending all that money to get all that stuff, how important is that stuff now? Here's here's, Here's how God has a sense of humor in one respect. You, you open presents under the tree because you thought you was going to get a new iPhone, and now you're just happy if you can find a roll of toilet paper. Hello? hello? People fighting at uh, Mount Pleasant. My, my dad saw two ladies getting a fight, fist fight, in Walmart over toilet paper. This, I mean, has God not got our attention yet? This world's crazy. People are fighting over toilet paper. I can tell you this, though. If you found Saturday, through the person of Jesus Christ, you're still satisfied today. You're still satisfied right now. You're not looking for another, are you? If you've got satisfaction with Him, then no matter what crook comes in your lot, you remain satisfied because He is the all-satisfying One. So in conclusion, I would say to you this. Fear God. Fear God. You will have to stand before Him. Fear God because life is hard. This crook may get more bent in the day. Things may get tougher. Things may be more uphill in the days to come. Fear God. Life is once. Life is once. This is the only shot you get. This is it. This life that God's given you. He's given you breath. He's given you a heartbeat. He's given you the ability to hear this message. You only get one shot at this deal. If you don't be right with God now, you're never going to be right with God. If you don't take... This opportunity of life to get serious about repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't get a do-over. There's no do-overs in this deal. You're born, you live, you die, eternity. You're born, you live, you die, eternity. What then? Eternity. What then? Eternity in heaven? Eternity in hell? All of those things are established now. What are you going to do now with the gospel? What are you going to do now with Christ? Life matters. Living for the one who is preeminent is the only way that you will experience the abundant life. You remember I said, when things are hard and things are difficult, hear one phrase from the old Puritan Thomas Boston. This phrase is, For believers... And I pray that it would encourage you. For the believer, 
This is all the hell you'll ever experience. For the believer, as bad as things may seem, this is all the hell you'll ever experience. What's Thomas Boston saying? He's saying, because when you die, you'll go to the city whose builder and maker is God, and there'll be no more sin, and every tear will be wiped away, and in heaven, everything will be made right, and we will be in the presence of our King for all of eternity. So however hard this is, it's all temporary for the believer. Now for the unbeliever, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because after this life, then you're really going to experience hell. But for the believer, all is well in glory. Application. I encourage you, church, to have faith. Faith obeys God even when the crook hurts. Right? The grandson's born, it hurts. In that hospital for some over 100 days and all those things, it hurts. What do you do? You pray. You cry. You sing. You call out to God. You ask this man over here, what do you do when your baby's head's being split open and make room for his brain? You pray. You cry. You worship. You seek God. What do you do when you have a miscarriage? You come to church and you sing and you pray and you cry and you worship. Because that's what faith does when there's a crook in your lot. You draw near unto God in order that God would draw near unto you. That's that's our response. I'm hurting. Oh, the government says don't gather. No, let's gather because I need to be with the people of God. And I need to hear from God. So we gather and by faith we trust that God would hear. Forget your pajama theology today. Not everyone gets well. Not everyone gets rich. Not everyone gets to live in a brick house. Not everyone gets a wife and two kids and a dog named Festus. Not everyone has 2020 vision. Not everyone gets to pastor a mega church with a six figure salary. And not everyone gets to be American. Get over it. Get out of your pajama theology and find out the reality that we live in a fallen world and things hurt sometimes and God bends our life and let us accept that reality and repent and seek Him with all of our heart. Love Him with everything that we have Him until His Son Jesus comes. Um, I don't even know what's going to happen after lunch. I'm pretty clueless big crook and this guy over here has gone through a crook this lady our hearts to expand the church to the end of the world we do not pray for more crooks to come in our lot or to increase in our lives but we do not pray to have a life without them we pray that as God determines what crooks in our lot that we need that we will respond to the crook with a robust fear of God a heart of humility that is eternal soul. And dear church, as your pastor, I'm living in the same community you're living in. I'm working with the same situation that you're working in. Yeah, I mean, the same stores that are closed to you are closed to me. The same parks that are closed to you are closed to me. The same situation. I can't get a haircut and before long I'm going to have a mullet. And that's going to look really cool. But I'm living in the same world. And I'm just encouraging you. Draw near to God. And he'll draw near to you. Take this time of this crook. Read the Bible with your family. Pray with your family. Spend serious time pursuing God in order that God can have his full and perfect work in you. I don't want to continue forever meeting in a parking lot, but I'll gladly meet here as long as God would have us to meet in this parking lot. It's much more comfortable inside, I know. But for now, this is what God has given us. So don't complain. Because God's the one who gave it to us. This is what He wants us to do. We're going to do it the best we can until He changes the situation. Again, we will part slowly in order out of each gate. Uh, you can give your offering on the way out. And uh, me and John will pray for you on your way out as well. And so thank you so much for coming. All you visitors, thank you. Continue to come, but as soon as your church opens, go back to your own church. But uh, as long as they're not having church, you're more than welcome to come. But we're not trying to get somebody from some other church. We, we're just having church because it's right to have church. All right, God bless you. Let me pray, and then we'll uh, uh, orderly make our way out of here today. Father in heaven, thank you so much.
for this word from Ecclesiastes, from Solomon himself, that God, you are to be beheld, you are to be meditated upon, we are to think upon your work and what you do. God, we thank you that you put crooks in our lot, make things tough. For God, if everything worked the way we wanted it, we'd probably end up not needing you. But God, these crooks remind us how much we desperately need you. Help your church to live out what she believes. She believes in your providence. She believes you're sovereign. She believes you're holy. She believes you're true. God, help us to live out that reality in our daily lives. Lord, we love you. And Lord, until we meet again, trust that you will continue guiding us and leading us for your glory and for our good. We pray these things today by your spirit in Christ's name. Amen.